मणस पास एक खास मरघी थी Good morning, gentlemen. What India needs is a water system for the 21st century. ये राशन कार्ड थी मरे पांचे घुटुम के हक्करो हक्करो हजार लीटर पानी मुफ्त जोड़ दो अन्य बेवो ये गनी भी सकोता धनजी अत्ला ओछा छोकरा के मार बैठे थे ठीक तो थे वैन दिना So, um, my work as a filmmaker and as an artist never ever begins with politics. It always begins with the power of a story to move the heart. And for me, this story began in Allahabad in India, where on a whim, a friend of mine asked me to document a religious festival called the Kumbha Mela, um, which kind of feels like the burning man of India. And um, an estimated 70 million people come to bathe at the sacred confluence of these three rivers, the Ganga, Jamna, and Saraswati rivers, because they believe um, at this auspicious time, it washes away sins and brings them closer to um, immortality or liberation. And so in living in a tent with two production guys and sort of filming, I sort of was moved by the millions of pilgrims who came to make offerings and moved by water as a sacred substance um, that people give reverence to. And through that experience, I started to ask some really critical questions. Through the love of that river, I started to, to, do, to read really fervently about water and water rights. And what I learned shook me out of my seat which is that between one half and two thirds of the world's citizens will not have access to clean drinking water by the year 2027. We hear a lot of statistics in our lives, but this one is a real stunner, so I'm just gonna say it again. Between one half and two thirds of the world's citizens, an estimated four billion people will not have adequate access just 15 years from now. And it's really not hard to see. I mean, this is the image of the Earth we see all the time. You can sort of garner from the clip that I'm sort of a science and science fiction fanatic, and so I spend a lot of time watching Nova videos. This is an image of the Earth that we often see, but it's still one that moves me. This is the biosphere, right? From the deepest bottom of the ocean to the tip of the ozone, this is all the life that we know exists on the planet, for sure, in the universe, for sure. And we now have to share this planet with 7 billion people. Now, less than 1% of the Earth is clean, potable drinking water. If we could see it on this globe, it would be a little spot. And so we are facing a crisis of epic proportions. Now, you know, like Star Wars, we sort of always want to believe that this crisis ha is happening in a galaxy far, far away. But it's actually happening right here at home. In the United States, over 36 states anticipate water shortages locally, regionally, and statewide within the next 10 years. It's happening in Atlanta, where they declared a state of emergency in 2007 and it was illegal to wash your car or water your lawn. You could be fined $500 because they were running out of water. It's happening in Detroit, where there's 40,000 people in the country we live in that don't have access to water because they can't afford to pay their water bill. And once they can't afford to pay, a company will come and cement over their connection to water. And once they do that, the home is considered unfit for living, and child services can come and take your children from you. So just on the basis of being poor, you can lose your right to life. 
just this past year, Las Vegas had a little over two months of, of water left in its reservoirs. Lake Mead is just 41% full after a decade-long drought. And what that means is that the Hoover Dam is producing 23% less electricity. The, the water body has fallen 130 feet. And when it gets below a certain level, the Hoover Dam will stop producing electricity. So our water security is deeply, deeply connected to our energy security. And one of the things that um, really affects our water and is a big threat to our, com our water in this country is the way that we make and use energy. Hydraulic fracturing, known as fracking, is what I call an experimental practice. It's when large volumes of water and sand and all kinds of chemicals are injected at very high pressures um, to crack the underground rock and to release the natural gas that's embedded in the rock. What's really scary about this is that it happens below 3,000 to 15,000 feet below where our natural aquifers are and is a threat to our drinking water. And what's supposed to protect us from the gas reaching our drinking water supply is a cement casing. Now, 6% of these cement casings fail right out of the gate. And 50% of them fail um, over the long term. Now, this is a really big threat to our water supply. And it's happening all over the country. Now, people always ask me why I get my um, my uh, inspiration for science fiction, it's from real life. In 2005, the Bush-Cheney Energy Bill exempted natural gas drilling from the Safe Water Drinking Act. Now this is terrifying stuff. This means that, that gas companies don't have to tell us what they're dumping into our water supply. They've essentially taken federal regulation and the EPA off the job. Now, as a result, gas companies are rushing to lease to do this kind of fracking in 34 states. Now, I'm a proud Brooklynite, a proud New Yorker, so for me, this is personal. The Marcellus Shale, where they are planning to drill, runs alongside the Delaware Water Basin and the New York City Reservoir. This is the, the largest unfiltered water supply in the world. It's the drinking water supply of 15.6 million people. And so without federal oversight, there's only one logical thing we can deduct. And that is fracking should only be used for bad, to substitute bad words on Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> Drilling for natural gas under 15 million people's water supply is a science fiction I never want to see. And water just doesn't affect our energy security. It's also intertwined with our water security, I mean with our food security. Two thirds of our water is used to grow food. And over the last two years, the United States has faced the worst drought we've seen in 25 years. In two, and in 2008, the Bush administration released a, a geological survey stunner and said the Southwest faces an era of permanent drying by the year 2050. And so as we reach more and more drought, our food supply is, is, is go, food prices are rising. We've seen wheat just this year go up 25%. Global food prices are up 10%. And this has caused rioting all over the world. The former vice president of the World Bank has said, if the wars of the 21st century were fought over oil, the wars of the next century will be fought over water. And we see that happening all over the world. This is the water conflict chronology map that Peter Glick was speaking about. And all these are not necessarily armed conflicts, but there are places where water is a point of conflict as a transboundary resource, as, as an international resource, people are vying for water all over the world. So the, sim the fact is simple and clear and terrifying. The demand for water is exceeding the supply. And as that happens, 
the price of water is going up. Someone on Wall Street says that over the next two to three years, the price of water in the US may rise 200 to 300 percent. Now, I created A Drop of Life as a science fiction. I had probably watched Blade Runner a few too many times, and I thought, OK, in the future, there's going to be these water prepaid water meters, and people will have to pay before they even get water. But then I learned through my process of research that these water meters exist today in 10 countries, including the United States, where Mexican migrants have to put quarters in a machine to get water before they get water. So this world where water is the privilege for only those who can afford it exists today. And companies and corporations are vying for every last drop. Now, there's no better example of this than bottled water. And many of us have come to believe that water, bottled water is actually healthier. But that's just not the truth. 40% of all bottled water is just our municipal tap water um, packaged back to us and often doesn't have the same federal regulations that our tap water does. And bottled water costs, on the average, about 500% more than tap water. And we, as Americans, are buying it. We are, we are spending over $15 billion a year on bottled water. This is money that we could be putting into keeping our tap water safe and clean. Now, I am a very unlikely environmentalist. You know, I, I'm from Brooklyn. My water runs hot and cold. I step on concrete. My food comes from the bodega. You know, what could I possibly have to do with the environment? And then there's a power outage, and the whole city's in darkness. And you realize, even in a big city like Chicago, we don't live inside a machine that even in big cities or in small towns, we live inside a very fragile ecosystem with very limited resources. And the everyday decisions we make really matter. And so on one side, we see water as a sacred substance, as something, as a public good, as a fundamental human right for everyone that should be safeguarded by all of us. And the, on the other side, we see those who think of water as pure commodity to be bought and sold to the highest bidder. Now, tap water in the US is amazingly clean. It is the envy of so many countries in the world. And, we, and it's protected. One of the reasons that it's so safe, it's protected by the Safe Water Drinking Act, passed by Nixon, right? And so it protects us against 91 chemicals. It could protect us against 60,000 chemicals, right? And I don't know about you, but I'm really angry that our politicians and leaders are telling us that the only way we can create jobs in this country is in ways that destroy our environment and cause a threat to our health and our well-being. An investment of $188.4 billion in water infrastructure, which is what the EPA says um, is what we need to make sure that our water preserves our water quality, would inject a quarter of a trillion dollars into the economy and create nearly 1.3 billion million jobs. Now, <clears throat> when I start to tell these stories, there's a way of feeling overwhelmed. You know, you sort of get this deep sinking feeling about this mounting crisis. And what could I possibly do, you know, to turn this situation around? But then I always take inspiration from the words of Han Solo. He says, never tell me the odds. Whenever he's talking to C-3PO and they have to make this impossible leap into the next galaxy, he says, never tell me the odds. And the reason that he says that is because there is no other alternative. There is no other choice. Our survival as a species depends on us. This is a fight that we cannot afford to lose. So one thing that we have on our side is the power of a story. You know, I never dreamed um, that this film would have the impact that it had. I mean, I was like, what do you do with an Indian girl that does sci-fi? You, know, you, don't, so you don't sort of know. But this film has been used um, as an organizing tool in 40 villages across Africa. 
Um, it's it's um, been used to help the, the campaign to boycott prepaid meters in South Africa. And so one of the things that I love about science fiction is that it's the story of the future, right? It's the story of the future. We get to imagine the story of the future. And the beautiful part is this is a script that we all write together, right? And so it's up to us to make these life-saving changes for our children. It's up to us to boycott bottled water. It's up to us to strengthen regulation that, and to use water more efficiently. It's up to us to say a drop of life you know, for, every, for, for the five million children who die every year from a water-related illness. It's up to us to say a drop of life for every girl child who is kept from an education because they have to walk 15 kilometers to collect water. It's up to us to say a drop of life for, every, for all of humankind and every species on the planet for generations to come. Thank you so much.